This is a podcast by Wellhouse Church, where personal spiritual growth is fueled through a variety of practices rather than a single prescriptive time of devotion, where we discuss different spiritual practices that help us be more present with God, others, and ourselves. What's going on, practitioners? What's up? We've got guest it. host Onyx. We got Onyx. Hey, come on, get down. Either get down <laughs> or get off the arm, bro. Yeah, come here. Yeah. Can you can you lay down? Crap or get off the pot, bro. <laughs> can you lay down? <laughs> you want to go see Dad? Oh, he's scared because of the storm. Oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's storming right now. Yeah, I got him. Come here, bud. Go come see on, Daddy. Come on. Go see Daddy. Come on. All right, he'll come when he's ready. All right. So, in the spirit of our new adventure, of <laughs> in the spirit of our new adventure of having a cocktail on this podcast, Clayton and I decided to have a cocktail battle. You in heard, a way of sorts. You heard about it last week or a couple of weeks ago, maybe. I don't know. The beef between us about whose old-fashioned recipe is better. It's mine. I, I, I'm not 100% sure. But, <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, I made my old-fashioned and my recipe. Clayton made his and his recipe. Clayton's is much more fancified. It's my specialty. Yeah, Clayton's extra. If you didn't know, <laughs> that's what that's what Clayton is. He's extra. And but, proud of it. <laughs> but okay, dude. It's a. It's okay. It's a welcomed change at times. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. Yeah, it. I don't think that his would be my nightly go-to recipe. Uh, like if I'm just looking for a cocktail in the evening, I'm probably not going with that. Um, I'm probably sticking with mine. There is something that he's done that I want to experiment in mine, which is just the type of sugar he uses. Well, just walk through your recipe just real quick. Yeah, so mine's super easy. It's two ounces of rye whiskey. It's a classic pre-prohibition old-fashioned. He says that. No, it's it not. Is. Clayton, you, you did not get orange bitters in 1990. It, that was an exaggeration. Yeah, no, they but had... But they did not have orange yes, bitters. Yes, they did. You they oh, did my God. We will look this up. They had old... They had orange bitters had, back had in pre-prohibition. Bitters. That's not the only kind of bitter they had in pre-prohibition. So you keep... But you keep saying... George Washington. That yes, the old fashioned in, in was, 1776. They did yes. not have. Oh my gosh! Yes, they did. Clay, the bitters. old fashioned was invented in the 18th century. Uh, That's yes, why that it's called true. the old. Fa- and they that had orange bitters. No, they did not. Yes, they did. Go read da- or not? Yeah, no. Hold on. Go read David Wondrich's imbibe, and you will find out that is not an old fashioned. Okay. Yes, it is. And second of all, just because one person says it in anything mixology, Jerry Thomas. Okay. In anything mixology, out. there are a ton of different variations. opinions and variations based on what history you have available you to keep you. keep calling it pre-prohibition though. It's not pre-prohibition. Clayton, when was the prohibition? Uh, 1920. 1920. Even if it wasn't in as early as I'm talking about, even if it wasn't George Washington, let's say I'm wrong. They definitely had orange bitters pre-prohibition in 1920. That's made... So it's that still a pre-prohibition recipe. Sure. But it so, doesn't go all the way back to George Washington. Yes, it does. Dude, like, yes, it does. Anyways, <laughs> it's two ounces of rye whiskey. It's two dashes of Ango bitters, two dashes of orange bitters. And here is a piece that's not pre-prohibition or as early they didn't make simple syrup back then no, they, they used, used a sugar cube yeah so but, but i everyone use uses a simple syrup yeah these but i people. use a bar spoon so like a just less than a quarter of an ounce of simple syrup the reason people use simple syrup is because it dilutes better yeah right it, yeah it, it dissolves just, into it, the drink yeah better. It, it it melds with the drink a little bit better mine is i'm not even going to try to call it pre-prohibition because it's not yeah um no, yours is definitely not. Mine is definitely not. Uh, in a way, like it could be, in a sense, because uh, I use Jerry Thomas Jerry Thomas's decanter bitters in mine. Mm-hmm. Um, two ounces of rye whiskey, quarter ounce of Demerara simple syrup, um, which is probably closer to the sugar cubes that they would have been using. Yeah. Um, because it's just raw cane sugar, essentially. 
Um, and so you have this darker sugar flavor. Right. Um, and so I use two dashes of Jerry Thomas decanter bitters from Bitter Truth and a dash of Ango and a dash of orange. Um, it just makes for a really full-bodied, well-rounded, old-fashioned. If I had my druthers, uh, my orange and lemon swaths would be flamed, and uh, it would be smoked, too. But Yeah, I don't have a lighter here, though, I don't yeah. think. No. Still a bit in the moving phase yeah. of this studio, and I just don't have we a lighter. We just don't have one. It's fine. So it happens. But I need to read more of this. But this is from The Bitter Truth. It's all about bitters. This is what it says. The first orange bitters were released in the 1880s. Okay. Fair enough. So it's definitely pre-prohibition. But not, Maybe not George Washington. It's not George Washington. Maybe not it, George Washington. It is pre-prohibition. Definitely pre-prohibition. That is, that's fair, but it doesn't go all the way back to, 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 to George Washington for sure. Yeah, that, that might be fair. I may have over-exaggerated that yeah. part, but it's definitely a pre-prohibition cocktail yeah, recipe. that's fair. All right, so let's talk about welcoming prayer. Yeah, let's do that. Our intro to this was not very welcoming, I and will say. We're brothers. <laughs> we're, I mean, people expect this from us. From time to time. And I'm an Enneagram 3. I compete at everything. <laughs> like, well, that's not true. I compete at things I'm good at. And while I don't make as many cocktails as you do, the ones I do make, I'm pretty proud of the recipes I have. I'm not saying they're bad, though. No, you're not. You're not. I used this exact recipe for a lot of years. You did. You did. You did. But let's talk about welcoming prayer. Let's do it. So welcoming prayer is an interesting is an interesting prayer practice. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll be honest, it's one that I should probably use more, and I don't. Um, and that's the thing about building this tool belt of prayer practices is inevitably something's going to fall through the cracks. Yeah. There's going to be one or two that should get more attention that don't. But there's a quote here, but is this one not in your? Yeah. So there's a quote here from Ted Lauder and it says, Oh God, I want so to belong. Teach me to accept. I want to be close. Teach me to reach out. I want a place where I'm welcome. Teach me to open my arms. I want mercy. Teach me to forgive. I want life. Show me how to die. And the whole idea is because we live our lives according to the premise that our situation determines our status. When Jesus calms the storm, the disciples are the like the, the perfect example of this. They go to Jesus. They see the storm. They're, they're in the middle of this situation. Jesus is asleep below. They go to Jesus and they say, Jesus, do you not care that we are dying? They're not dying. But their situation is determining their status. Mm. Their situation of being in the storm is determining in their mind their status of death. And Jesus comes out, he's like, no, 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 your situation does not determine your status. I determine your status. And that's when he says, like, why do you have such little faith? We live every day that way, yeah. that our situation determines our status. I'm going through trials. God must not love me. I'm struggling. Well, God must not care about me. If God cared about me, he wouldn't leave me here. We let the things happening around us determine what's happening. Yeah. The desire of welcoming prayer is to welcome Jesus into every part of my life, body, circumstances, and relationships. The definition is welcoming prayer is a way to detach from my needs to be secure, liked, and in control and attach to the presence of Jesus instead because here's what happens. If you live your life according to the premise that my situation determines my status, if you are secure, liked, and in control, why do you need Jesus? Mm. Hmm. Fair point. And so we grasp ourselves to these three categories of what we need. 
And we forget about Jesus a lot of times until we find ourselves in a place where we need those things, where you're no longer in control, where you don't feel secure, and you don't feel liked or loved. And so Adele has this thing in here, and she says, Welcoming prayer addresses three fundamental needs hardwired into our psyches. The need for affection and love, security and safety, and a sense of agency or power. You know, that seems like kind of a... uh a condensed list of Maslow, in a way. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. What is it? The five, five laws of Mas- Maslow's law, or something like that. I, I don't yeah. remember what all of them are at the top, top of my head, but I'm pretty sure it's five. They use it in nursing a lot. I heard a ton about Maslow's law, and when Hunter was in nursing school. Yeah, Maslow. Pl- I, I haven't talked about Maslow in a long time. So. Yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure it's five, but. She has, she has this really profound statement here. She says, Without love, we fail to thrive. Without security, we resort to fight or flight or freeze. Without control, we live someone else's reality, deny our needs, attack, withdraw, and so on. If we feel we don't have enough affection or security or control, we often fall out of freedom into trigger reactions and compulsive habits. Mm. When this happens, it is ego rather than the spirit of Jesus that is at work in our psyche, soul, and body. In ego mode, freedom evaporates and rationalization, denial, and blame take over. We become self-referenced, overly sensitive and reactive. When people don't do what we want, we take offense. If we are corrected, we cringe and project our flaws onto others. How many times do you know that you've lived that exact narrative? Weekly? Monthly? A lot. Yeah, it's like, absolutely. Here's what welcoming prayer does in her mind. Welcoming prayer lands us in the middle of our hot mess with Jesus so his kingdom can come and his will be done. The prayer releases and accepts. Mm. It's a small death expressed in four movements that give room to Jesus and not just our ego. In this moment, we say, Jesus, I let go of my need to be safe and secure. Welcome. Jesus, I let go of my need to be accepted and approved of. Welcome. Jesus, I let go of my need to control this person or event. Welcome. Jesus, I let go of my need to change reality and receive it as it is. Welcome. So I know why my brain is going here. It's simply because of the word welcome. Um, But I, I don't think that it's out of place. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Yeah. Right? That that song that's so popular. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's what you're doing. Yeah. You are inviting God into your every situation. Yeah. And I will tell you, the reason I don't do this prayer very often... It's because you don't want to relinquish control. Oh, my God. I'm an Enneagram 3. All of those things give me anxiety. Just, yeah. <laughs> just reading those to pray about them give me extreme anxiety. I mean, let go of my need to feel safe and secure. This is exactly why threes act the way they act. Yeah. To be accepted and approved of, exactly why threes act the way they act. Yeah. Need to control this person or event, exactly why threes act the way they act. To change reality, our guilty sin is deceit. So that this feels like kind of an upstream practice for you. Oh my God, you ain't lying. <laughs> if there were ever one. This is it. If there were ever one. You know, when I'm in disintegration, when I'm unhealthy, yeah, yeah that, that is true for me as well. Yeah. Uh, when I'm doing better and, you know, recently, like last week or so, I've been feeling pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And so like I'm feeling a lot better about God, you're going to do what you're going to do. Yeah. You know, go for it. <laughs> like, yeah. And I've kind of been praying this kind of thing. I actually prayed it this morning. Mm-hmm. We can talk about that off camera, but yeah. Um, I didn't realize I was doing a welcoming prayer, but yeah. Yeah. 
For me, I think this is really important because... As a three, for me, I probably live this reality more than anyone else because threes have this innate desire that somewhere in their childhood, they determined that they must perform in order to be loved. Yeah. And so if my life is falling apart around me and I'm not performing, I'm not loved. Yeah. Now, I know that's not true. Right. But like, I can know that in my head and feeling that in my heart are a very different thing. Well, but everyone has those irrational things that we believe. Yes. Right? And Preach. That, that's just yours. Yes. You know, I have irrational fears yeah. that, that drive me every day. Yep. Um, being completely honest and vulnerable. And I was completely honest and vulnerable with some people the other day about this. I haven't told you this because you are someone that, plays a big role in this okay. in my life and but I am afraid that I'm going to die alone it was so crazy that I said yeah. that. Clay <laughs> said I'm afraid I'm going to die alone and literally the biggest clash of thunder ever just happened right outside our studio <laughs> Lord Jesus please don't let me <laughs> don't let me die alone Jesus <laughs> but take yeah. this cup from me <laughs> That is one of my biggest fears is that I'm yeah. going to die alone is that I'm going to push everyone else away from me. Huh? And because of my fears and anxiety, because of your six nature. Yeah. I'm going to push everyone away from me. Yeah. And I'm going to die alone. Yeah. And that is completely irrational. Yeah. Right. And I'm not, I know like intellectually that right. is irrational, but that is one of those things like Jesus, I relinquish control over my relationships. Yeah. And you're going to do what you're going to do. Yeah. No, it's true. And Adele brings up a good point that uh, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about. You may not know it's the welcoming prayer when you do it, but the simple phrase, I need help. No. The simple prayer, well, that might be it too. In a but way, yeah. The simple phrase from the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done, mm. thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is the welcoming prayer. That, that alone is the welcoming prayer yeah. because your will is to feel loved, to feel secure, to feel liked, to feel valued. That was a big one, huh, bud? <laughs> God's will is not necessarily that those things don't happen, but his version of what that looks like might be very different than what yours does. Yeah. And we all find ourselves in these situations, right? If you feel like you need to perform at work, if you feel like you're underperforming at home, if you feel like you don't feel secure because you don't make enough money, Mm. Right. What, whatever it is, if your marriage is not a safe space any longer, you feel disconnected from your spouse because the lack of communication and you no longer feel safe and secure in that space. Each and every one of those things is a piece, an element of the welcoming prayer. Yeah. Or, the welcoming prayer can play a role in each of those categories of your life. Because, let's be honest, we all have jobs that we want to perform well in. Yep. We all have to make money in order to live. So there's a sense of security that comes with finances. Mm -hmm. We all want to be liked. And we all want to feel safe in our most deepest relationships. Absolutely. Every one of those categories at some point, if not often feel attacked. Mm. And in those attacks, Adele is right. If you don't return to the Lord with the welcoming prayer in those moments, you are going to react 
out of your fears and insecurities. Yeah. Clayton has a six. How often does reacting, not being proactive, but reacting out of fears and anxieties lead you into a good space? Rarely ever. Rarely ever. It can. You know, we talked about on Let's Talk last week. Dude. <laughs> Onyx is all up in Clayton's grill. He is not digging. He is not digging. The storm. The storm God. at all. Um, as we talked about last week on Let's Talk, fears and anxieties can be a good thing. Yeah. Um, because they can lead you to... Um, Make better choices and, yes. and and be able to predict certain undesirable outcomes, mm-hmm. right? Um, but reacting to those instead of being proactive about those, mm-hmm. never good. Yeah. That's the deal never good. Is, is being in a situation where you're letting or being in a place where you're letting your situations determine your status means that you're reacting to your situation. Absolutely. Just like the disciples. Preach. Had they been proactive and said, hey, I got a lot of anxiety and fear about the storm that I see as we're out here in the middle of nowhere, mm-hmm. but I also know that's irrational because of the things I've seen Jesus do and the fact that he's asleep Mm. in the bow and the fact that he's already told us that this is not how he's going to die, that he's not done yet, that there's a redemptive work that needs to happen. That's a proactive way of dealing with anxieties and fears. The reactive is looking at your situations and running to Jesus who's Dead asleep, by the way. Perfectly fine. And going, bro, do you not care that we're dying? (laughs) Because here's what happened. It feels so hilarious. Well, the reason it feels hilarious is because we do this all the time. Yeah, exactly. There have been, there has been zero actual harm come to them in this moment. Yep. And when they go to Jesus... They say, do you not care that we are perishing? Present tense. Yeah. They've already decided that they're going to die. And they're living as a reaction to the status that they've given themselves. Fight, flight, or freeze. Mm. They're doing the same things that we do now. And instead of inviting Jesus into the moment, to help calm the fears and anxieties, they run to him saying, dude, do something. Yeah, what are you doing? Do you not care that we're dying? Yeah. I wonder how much our lives could change if we could run, instead of running to Jesus saying, change something, welcomed him into the situation to calm the storm in our lives.